Hello, students of ancient history. I hope everyone has enjoyed the first unit of our class over the ancient world. And this week we are going to begin our study of the classical world. And this is going to begin with Greece. And we've already looked at Bronze Age Greece. We have, uh, we've examined the, the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations, which are the, the uh, ancestors of the classical Greeks. Um, but we're going to get right into kind of this, this uh, the more classical world of Greece and Rome now. And um, we will really be leaving the ancient, uh, the ancient Near East in the sense of, of uh, moving beyond Mesopotamia and, uh, and the rest of the world that our focus from this point forward will be on the classical world and really on the world of the Mediterranean. And uh, we just have, simply have to make choices in this class of where we're going to examine, where we're going to look at. And I think that um, for well, Western culture, that the, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, um, had a much greater impact upon um, Western history, which uh, we are a, a product of. And therefore, we will be examining this, uh, this, um, Western, this uh, descent of Western civilization. So the Greek time periods that we'll really be looking at are the, uh, the Orientalizing, Archaic, and uh, then eventually the Classical uh, time periods. And this is from about 900 to the, uh, the conquest of Alexander, the death of Alexander the Great in 323. And Greece, the, uh, the peninsula of Greece, it was um, it's extraordinarily rocky. Um, it's it's uh, it's not a great place for growing really much other than olives, as has been uh, seen with the the, the Greek uh, crisis, debt crisis, and whatnot. So they really struggle to have industry and things like that. But Greece really becomes one of the centers of the world because of their their inventions of in thought and thinking and government and uh, military, and uh, therefore we are going to spend some time looking at these these things that made Greek civilization great. Um, but as I say, Greece itself is, uh, uh, is a peninsula uh, with many hundreds, thousands of islands um, that make up this, this, uh, this culture, this Greek-speaking culture. And beginning in the, after the Dark Age Crisis, which is this, this great event that destroyed central governments all over the world, at around 1200, 1100, uh, we see just the collapse of, of basically all Bronze Age civilizations at some point. And uh, then around 1100 or, or uh, the year 1000 BC, we begin to see the advent of iron weapons, which is it brings a, a whole new uh, level of uh, to, to uh, a whole new component to warfare and civilizations. And Greece was no different. Um, the anarchy that descended after the time of uh, the the uh, Bronze Age crisis um, comes. To Greece, and you see a collapse of their traditional Mycenaean uh, systems of government, of regional autonomy, and and uh, of trade and things like that. Um, and then we we instead see groups of wealthy farmer merchants um, who control everything. It becomes an uh, oligarchy, right? That the small groups of people of uh, entrenched local regional elites control everything and uh, if you are not part of the club you're never going to get to be part of the club there's really no social mobility or anything of that nature everything is of course centered on farming all things in the ancient world are focused on farming that is the key to all things is agriculture and um along with these groups of of uh, wealthy landowners sort of one of them would would uh, rise up and become more powerful than everyone else, and they would seize power um, without any kind of election or popular assent or anything of that nature. And they would, uh, and they were called tyrants, meaning they just simply grabbed power and they ruled without any authority to rule. And this problem of oligarchy and uh, tyranny created something that historians have called stasis or stasis and this allowed for these people to continually fight to uh or the, the situation of, of continual fighting of endemic warfare 
um, created a just a stasis uh, within the own uh, the culture and there's really no development there's very little change and there's as I say very little opportunity for social mobility during the uh, the dark Greek dark age period is in the uh, the archaic period so beginning in uh, the 8th century BC so the 700s BC we see a new kind of Greek culture beginning to develop colonization meaning that adventurers left the Greek peninsula the homeland and they went out and they founded new civilizations created new opportunities that this would create new power elites and the uh, invention uh, development new thinking new ways of doing things um, this is basically responsible for driving the development of classical Greece and along with that came uh, writing that uh, this is the century that we see the development of, of uh, true Greek script and, and, uh, and text and two of the the greatest pieces of work what did the Greeks write down when they invented uh, their their uh, their alphabet well the very first thing they wrote down were the Iliad and the Odyssey these great stories of the war of Troy that happened um, right at the, the beginning of the the uh, Bronze Age crisis and this is what they, they they thought was the most important thing and then we will uh, also we also see um, the the emergence of two key cultural centers at Delphi which is the great oracle that people from all over the world came to let them predict the future and tell them what to do uh, who is, uh, is um, it was very very famous oracle right someone who can foretell the future in the ancient world as well as uh, the uh, the city the region of Olympia and the Olympic Games that brought all the the uh, the Greeks together to uh, to celebrate in this in this great event of athletic uh, prowess. So we have already talked about colonization and here we see the kind of the Greek sphere of influence is the northern part of the Mediterranean world and over here in the Black Sea. Um, whereas the their uh, sort of trading rivals, the Phoenicians, um, were here in the south of the Mediterranean. And when they had this contact with the Phoenicians, it also, uh, there's some cross-pollination that we think that Phoenicians encouraged, or the Greeks were inspired to create their language uh, from Phoenician lang from Phoenician writing. That they were not their language, but their, the, their uh, alphabet. Their, they were able to write things down, and they followed in the Phoenicians' uh, wake. So as I said, when the Greeks were able to write they wrote down the Iliad and the Odyssey and these are the works of the 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 poet Homer and there has been some debate uh, whether Homer was a group of poets or whether Homer was a single individual capable of writing this um, I think the burden of evidence is on the people uh, who say that there were a group of poets who wrote this rather than one because it has been passed down through tradition that for thousands of years it's been believed that this is the work of the Homer not the Homeric poets um, so I, I think that the, perhaps the jury is out but I think the burden of evidence is on the people who who think that there were many and not just one great poet and again this is the exemplification of Greek culture it is the exemplification uh, of the warrior elite that this is uh, the the story of the Iliad is written about the Trojan War uh, Helen of Troy uh, the the prince of Troy Paris steals Helen away and she is is um, held captive in Troy and the Greeks led by the king Agamemnon of Mycenae lead a massive uh, fleet with thousands and thousands of warriors including the great uh, warrior Achilles to fight against the uh, the Trojans and the year the the, uh, the war lasts 10 years and it demonstrates the great warrior culture of Greece and the Greek gods end up fighting and they they pick their favorites and and it's a, it's a it's an incredible story that t uh, that uh, shows what the Greeks thought was most important in their own culture and that is the concept of honor
uh, the concept of courage and uh, wisdom, that all wisdom is gained through suffering in Greek idea, and that honor can um, lead, that uh, one's honor is the most important thing. But you may suffer because of your honor, as uh, the great warrior Achilles' cousin Patroclus is killed because of of uh, Achilles' honor was hurt by the king Agamemnon, and he refused to compromise to any extent, but he suffered because Patroclus pretended to be Achilles and was killed on the field of battle. So it is, it's, a, it's a tale of how one gains wisdom, how one gains courage, how one gains immortality. It's a, it's a great, great story, and I would encourage you to take some time and read this if you, if you, uh, if you can. And then, of course, the, uh, the Trojans are defeated by the Greeks through deception. That they build, after 10 years, they, they construct a horse and they hide in it and they leave it as a, as a supposed offering to the god, sea god Poseidon, and they get on their ships and they leave. And the, uh, the trickster captain, Odysseus, he and some of his men from Ithaca climb in the Trojan horse and they hide out. And sure enough, the Trojans drag the horse into their city, take it to the temple of Poseidon, and have a great old drunken feast because they had uh, defeated the Greeks, so they believed. And then in the middle of the night, the, uh, the captains of Greece, led by Odysseus, unlock the city gates and allow the rest of the Greeks who have come back in the night into the city, and they sack Troy and burn it to the ground. So this is, is this great tale. And um, there's many, many stories that go into it. I just simply don't have time. And then the second only to the Iliad in Greek composition. These are, these are the Bible and the, the national anthem of Greece. They are the most important pieces of literature um, that Greece has. Second only to the Iliad is the Odyssey, and that is the story of the captain Odysseus, the one who hid in the, uh, the Trojan horse, and his journey to get home. And it, again, teaches many moral lessons and, uh, and life lessons within this great story. And he finally gets home to Ithaca, only to find it uh, besieged by pirates. And, um, and he eventually wins and uh, gets back his kingdom, um, but, uh, but only through great, great struggle. So I want to discuss another very important part of Greek culture here, and I mentioned the Oracle of Delphi. And when one went to Delphi, or Delphi, um, they came to seek the wisdom of the Oracle. And the renown and the power of the Oracle grew over 300 years, basically. And people from all over the ancient world came to see the future, or ask questions of the future, because Human beings, I think it's a universal condition, worry about things that they cannot control, that they don't know the answers to. So they seek the knowledge of the gods. And um, so this oracle was able to be a medium between the gods and uh, mankind that they could come and ask a question and the oracle would relate uh, to them these, uh, these lessons. And, and you don't get to be an oracle and stay in business for a thousand years if you aren't occasionally right, is all I would, would say. Um, for, uh, but uh, they would often give very, very um, bland and general answers. Uh, say a king w uh, came and uh, asked, uh, should I go to war? And the oracle said, a great empire will fall and a great empire will uh, win a, a great victory. Well, you can either assume that you will be one of these two things if you go to war. So um, often it's what you read into it. But the Greeks considered Delphi to be the center of the world. And this was a place that you could come to, uh, to have diplomatic talks, that it was a, a place that where warring states could mediate their differences. And... Um, and it was extremely inf influential in that, um, that they believed that this is, this is a, the, the place that you could come together, that you would not have to fear uh, assassination or, 
or uh, threats, and all the Greek cities would, would use this as a, as a place of diplomacy. And uh, Olympia as well, um, this is where the great uh, Olympic Games were held, and it was a, a dedication to the god Zeus, the king of the gods, and uh, again, this exemplified the great uh, warrior prowess of uh, in uh, masculinity that the games were held every four years, beginning in 776, and we see the development that originally you didn't really go to uh, fight or or uh, play for your 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 polis, your city state, but you were looking only for your individual glory. But eventually, it comes to be very patriotic in that if you were from uh, Mycenae, if you were from Corinth, if you were from Athens, you were not just uh, you know Tom the uh, discus thrower, but rather you were Tom the discus thrower of Athens. So you came to represent your polis eventually. And it was really a wonderful time, again, that the Greeks got to come together um, and they got to, uh, to compete without having to fight wars against each other, which they often did, and diplomacy um, uh, and talks could happen. And it's a really wonderful cultural development. Um, so within Greek culture. Again, I told you that the two most important things written, pieces of literature, um, are, are uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. But also there is another writing that is important, but it is, it's, a, it's a distant third. And the, the poet Hesiod wrote something called the Theogony. And this is the story of the, the birth, the evolution of the gods, and much of the classical Greek mythological stories um, come down through Hesiod's uh, writing, uh, his, uh, his uh, work, The Theogony. And we see that there's an enormous influence of the Orient, of the uh, ancient Near East, upon Greek culture and Greek thinking that many of the myths of Greece are similar to ones that we have seen that are, that are earlier uh, within the ancient Near East. For instance, the Greeks, uh, how they believed the world came into to being, I said in an earlier lecture that there is always chaos. And then out of the elements, so you have uh, Uranus, which is literally the sky, and Gaia, who is the earth. And, uh, and Uranus lays upon Gaia and produces the titans, and then from the titans come the gods. Um, it's very similar to the Enuma Elish with Marduk, the, the uh, king of the gods, who slays Tiamat, and from this comes... Uh, um, the, the offspring of, of these two things, which represent elements, water and uh, uh, sky. Also, we see similar figures in a Gilgamesh and a Hercules, or a Samson and a Hercules. Um, we see much sharing within the, the uh, Greek uh, world with the Orient, and especially this can be seen through, through Hesiod's Theogony. So this is all for today. I hope you have come to have uh, some appreciation for um, Greek culture and how the Greeks uh, came to develop as a sort of a, a special, special uh, place within uh, Western civilization because this is where it kind of all begins and, and Rome uh, carries it on. But uh, we will look at uh, myth coming up next week. Take care, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.